guests are going to be leading the activities tonight. And if you want to comment where you're joining us from and just to say hello, that would be awesome. You can comment on the live video below. And we just want to welcome everyone for coming. I know that we have a lot of guiding members who are joining us and also some non-guiding members as well. Um, so thank you everyone for coming. And for our guiding members, for those of you who are like me and love to earn badges and do program work, you may want to go into the program as we're going along and see if any of these activities fit into the Girls First program. And I'd suggest starting by looking in our guide together and connecting question program areas. So Kate, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, well, I heard that you actually used to be a girl guide yourself. I was a brownie for a, quite a short amount of time, quite short. Uh, I am, um, I conflicted with my being a horse girl. So I know that sometimes those two can uh, coexist, but for me, it, it didn't, I didn't have enough time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> tough choices. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, Kate is going to tell us a little bit about her role today, and then we're going to go into some of the archives at the BC Museum. And then we're going to do an activity where you get the chance to make your own archives. Um, so you might want to have a pen handy and something to write on, like a piece of paper. And feel free to pop any comments or questions in the comment box at any time, and we'll try to get to them and ask Kate them. Uh, so let's get started. Kate, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to become an archivist? You betcha. Uh, so as Chris has said, my name is Kate. I'm an archivist at the uh, Royal BC Museum and Archives, the BC Archives in particular. Um, I've only been working at the BC Archives for about 10 months. I started last summer. So it's been a, a weird uh, first year, but uh, it's been very fun uh, and, and I've learned so much. Uh, so I found my way to archives mainly from um, being at university studying history. My first uh, interest was in history and in particular BC history. Uh, I find that, found that the way that BC came to be uh, as it is uh, a province now in such a short amount of time and what it took for that to happen and, and so what the consequences that had um, and what, what sort of amazing things happened in that time uh, was really interesting to me. Um, but I also knew that I didn't want, I didn't necessarily want to teach. I didn't want to be an academic. I wanted to be somehow in this world of history, but uh, somehow differently. And I didn't know exactly what that looked like at the time. Um, I did, I had the opportunity to take a class in uh, my undergrad that uh, was talking a lot about what uh, it meant to, what the theory and practice of history was. How was history created? Um, how did it, um, how, what documents uh, uh, show up so that, or what, what exists, what's saved, what's made important um, so that uh, history can be created and, and uh, perpetuated uh, and changed and, and developed. Um, so that is where I found um, what uh, what archives were. I didn't going into this. I didn't know what archives were. Um, uh, I didn't understand that thing that history could really change. I kind of thought of it as static and um, unchanging. Um, but as soon as I started doing archival work and thinking about um, who creates it and how those people that do create history are individuals and have their own perspectives and their own biases, um, that, it, that sort of that aspect of it really uh, came to life for me. Um, that's what, what really uh, drove my interest in, in archives. Um, so that, that was the side that, that really interested me. How do these uh, documents get saved? How, uh, how do they get preserved? How do people find them? And that's one of the biggest things um, that uh, is part what Archives is about. Um, so after that, I, I still spent a couple of years sort of uh, lost and not sure exactly what I wanted to do. I think that's a pretty common experience for people. Um, but found my way into uh, grad school uh, for Archives specifically. Um, and that's, um, that's how I got uh, into the field. Um, it's a it's a great field, and it, it sometimes it helps to have a history degree. But there are so many um, 
aspects of archival work that you don't need a history degree for. Um, going as we move into the future, which is where we are. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, Degrees like computer science are really um, useful for it. There's a lot of database work and a lot of um, coding behind the scenes that's necessary for, um, for archives to be uh, discoverable and for people to, to be able to access them digitally uh, and for these digital records that so many places are creating um, so that those can be preserved and, and made accessible. So, and even if you have a specific interest, you have uh, an interest in science. There's a lot of um, archives that hold a lot of science records that um, that you could be really invested in, um, in that. So that's that's sort of how I got through through history. But um, there's a lot of different ways that you can you can wind up in the archives. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. And it's such an interesting point what you said about how history is right now, and especially now during these interesting times. I'm sure that there's a lot lots of um, things that you can be kind of archiving now to save for the future. Um, so can you tell us a little bit like going on every day? Sorry, I lost you there for one second. Could you repeat the question? Yeah. Sorry about that. Um, so I was just wondering, um, what does your day to day look like? I know that the BC Museum is a very big place. And I was just wondering what you do every day in your job. So uh, I am just one of several archivists. Uh, there's about six of us on our team that work uh, every day downtown at, at the BC Archives. Uh, and so we all have a variety of different jobs. Um, I, my specific title is reference archivist, so you'll often find me in the reference room, uh, helping people find records, um, uh, trying, uh, helping people understand how records are kept, um, giving tours, uh, trying to do some digital outreach, um, and they'll also do some uh, records description as well. So the description is taking these records that come into us um, and trying to make sense of them for researchers. So often uh, the difference between, um, uh, as say an archives in a library is that um, in, in a library, those books uh, exist, might exist in other libraries all over the place. It's not the only version of that book. In archives, uh, those records are the only version. If it, you have a photograph, it's the only photograph that's exactly like that. Thing with something like a diary, it's the only, it's a unique object. Uh, so because of that, we can't lay a sort of a, an overarching a description over these kind of records. Everything is so unique, we need to make sense of that for people. Um, say if this was a diary written by a, a woman in the 1930s, we would talk about her experiences, where, what this means in the greater um, context of her life, where that where she was that sort of thing so everything is so unique that's why um archival description is so uh different than uh than library description but it is similar to the to the way museum objects are are described as well because a lot of objects have their own unique stories and um and uh, unique identifiers and they might be the only one of that um, object that's ever existed um but we deal in the realm of sort of it, in a very simplistic term, it's two-dimensional versus three-dimensional. So if you think of museums as, as three-dimensional objects that you can hold and move around, um, archives are more dealing with this two-dimensional paper, uh, photographs, uh, and information uh, that, goes, that, that is held on those, those formats. So that's what the, the description part, that's a bit of a background, a, a long story long. Um, that's a bit of a background to the description part of my job, um, but we also, we do a lot of different things and, and fill in uh, where it's necessary. There's a, a lot of really cool things going on in the archives right now. Awesome. <laughs> we actually have a few questions that are already coming in for you. Great. Um, the first one is from Danielle and she was wondering what's your favorite artifact or archive? Oh gosh, there's, I think uh, someone else has coined this term. There's um, uh, treasure fatigue that you see so many cool things that you kind of, it kind of just gets overwhelming and it's, and you're, you're no longer amazed by them. 
Um, so I, sometimes I find myself uh, in that situation. Um, but I like I, I like a lot of the land records that we have. So a lot of the um, a large percentage of the BC Archives collection is government records. Uh, about four fifths of it or so. Uh, and so everything that the province of British Columbia produces and the records of that it produces that are kept uh, wind up with us. So some of those are really dry, boring administrative records, but some of them are, are really cool old ones where that describe um, where what what the process of surveying certain areas was, what um, that, and then drawing maps of those, of, of sort of rudimentary maps um, and that, sh that are showing trails. And you'll often see um, sort of indigenous records scattered among them, even though these aren't by indigenous people, you'll see um, indigenous information because there, there are places where people had been living or where people had been um, fishing and that sort of thing. So you'll see these sort of things that are, that weren't necessarily meant to um, represent indigenous people as we would these days, but um, that they do show up and, the, and you can tell that people were there and had been there for thousands of years. So these things that sort of show up in these, as what you would think of it as government boring administrative records um, do show up with really, really interesting data, sort of almost, almost by accident. Great, that's awesome. And just to add on to that, we also have another question. So how do all of those things get into the archives and our museum? Are they, do you search for them or do people donate them? There's sort of two different ways of how things wind up with us. Uh, one of them is that those government records that I talked about just now, um, and that we, it's provincially mandated that those come to us. That's, that's their, the end of their, life as a government record and then they become an archive so that um, that's how we get them. It's just sort of an automatic thing that they come to us, but we also accept uh, private records. So we have a private records program uh, where businesses or private individuals or community groups, that sort of thing can donate their records to us. And we do have a um, mandate where we collect records that represent the province as a whole because we are the provincial entity. Um, there are smaller municipal archives or regional archives or even uh, subject specific archives that take uh, different records that um, are reflected that reflect a certain smaller area. So if we, we will try and accept things that um, that do represent the, the province as a whole. Um, so say it's a, a photographer that went and took photos all across northern BC. Uh, and so it might make the most sense for it to, to come uh, be preserved with us. Um, but sometimes uh, if it's not, uh, records related to one specific town, um, those records might be best suited at, the, at a local archives because then the people that it's related to can access it more easily. Um, but it is, it's, it's a bit of a balancing point too. Um, so yeah, so that's basically how those private records come to us. And it is a process. We can't take everything. We just, it, we don't have the space or the, or the staff or the energy to take everything. But um, yeah, so as long as it's, it has some sort of relevance to BC, we're, we're definitely open to it. Awesome. Well, thanks for asking all those questions, guys. And I think now we're going to dive in to see some Girl Guide artifacts that are living at the museum. Um, and Kate, while you pull up your screen, we do have another question. What is the oldest record that we have in the archives at the Royal BC oh, Museum? Well, it depends on how you um, decide that. We do have a, a library collection uh, that has books, I think, I think from the 1500s. So they're oh, wow. not necessarily archival and they're not uh, so BC related. I think it's some of the um, Captain Cook related material that we have that is sort of, um, it's related to BC because it's sort of the, that broader area of, of his travels. Um, so some of that stuff is, is older. I don't think that's the 1500 stuff, but um, yeah, some of that stuff is the oldest. The library collection probably has the oldest stuff. I'm, I'm not sure exactly in the archives what is the oldest. Um, there's some of those colonial records go back to 18, 1840s, 1830s. But uh, yeah, somewhere around that. I, I can't say for certain. That's pretty old, 1500s. Yes. <laughs> so I am going to start sharing my screen. 
All right, where are we? There we go. So I wanted to talk just a little bit, show a couple examples of uh, what some, some of our other ar records in the archives look like. So these are a couple different marriage records. Uh, so if you're someone who wants to do genealogy and if you have family that has lived in British Columbia for, uh, for years, we may have records that are related to you or your family. Uh, they can also tell something about um, the, the area that people lived in, um, how long people lived uh, for certain years. So this one on the left hand side is a marriage res registration and it's from the vital events uh, department. So it is a government record uh, and those ones uh, are, are comprised of births, deaths, and marriages, uh, and we have some baptisms uh, as well that we sort of think of as genealogy records. Uh, and so they look a lot like these. These are some old ones. I think this is from 19 or 1872, uh, all handwritten. Uh, these ones have been uh, scanned to microfilm, which is why they don't look like an original document on the, um, the marriage res registration on the left there. On the right is the oldest, uh, the first marriage license uh, given after uh, British Columbia entered Confederation. So it was in 1971. Uh, and it's just an example of another one of those sort of government documents that maybe aren't as dry as you might think, or maybe they're just old, so they look a little bit cooler. <laughs> uh, and so we do have a lot of records in the collection um, from the government, uh, from the government collection, from the government records that uh, are in our holdings, that um, they can be used in a variety of different ways. There's um, some. Sorry, we have a question here. Um, so, are any of these records that we have requested by other provinces or countries? So, is it uh, somebody that has has moved away from British Columbia requesting, or is it sort of are these? are they reflective of the rest of the country? Because if it's, sorry, I think you're frozen for a second. Um, it's, we only have uh, records related to British Columbia for government records. Um, We, sorry, I'm not sure if I've frozen or you've Kate, frozen. No, Kate, you're, you're okay, you can continue. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, what I think the, the question is that, um, do these records, or do we have records for genealogy for vital events for other places in the world? No. <laughs> we only have uh, records for, for these sort of things for British Columbia. Uh, we, there is some crossover for a lot of older records between um, Washington State and the western parts of, of um, the United States because the borders weren't as set um, and a lot of the, the fur trading records that we have sort of span across the western uh, part of Canada and of the United States. So we do have um, a number of things from Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba, those sort of things as well in the Yukon. So it does uh, lead a little bit across the borders, but um, for the most part for government records, we only have um, uh, British Columbia. Um, but there are other provinces across the country do have um, their own versions of these and, it, and some, are, some are quite accessible uh, and some are not. Pretty much every province in Canada has a um, provincial archive. Um, and there is the Library and Archives Canada, which is the, the governing body, um, or sort of the, where the, the, the repository for federal records and for records that relate to uh, Canada as a whole sort of find their way. That, Carissa, that's wonderful. Um, so I'm going to just continue on. So these are a, uh, just a few examples of some of the record formats that we have in our collection. Um, and what we have here, there is some film on the top left. Uh, we have a diary on the, on the right. We have um, the sleeve for a, um, a record. I think that's a seven inch record um, that would have been produced for 
um, the 1958 centennial, I believe 1958, um, maybe 1967. Um, and then a, 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 a sort of a survey map of Vancouver, not looking exactly what you would think of what uh, Vancouver looks today. But you can see on there, there's False Creek identified, there's uh, Burrard Inlet identified. Um, so we do have a lot of uh, materials that do look like that, that aren't, aren't sheer, um, your solid, finished, completely surveyed and mathematical uh, map. Thank you. Moving on. So the uh, Girl Guide records that we have in our collection are a really good example of um, private records that come into our holdings. Uh, the Anything that's related to Girl Guides has sort of come in from a variety of different areas. The uh, We do have records from the BC uh, a provincial Girl Guides Commissioner. Um, so we do have this official repository of records that, um, official collection of records that uh, is uh, comprised of a number of different materials. It'll, it's a lot of textual records related to um, administrative uh, duties to, uh, with pamphlets and, um, and newspaper clippings, that sort of thing, uh, and photographs and some sound recordings. Um, but because we are working from home right now, we don't have access to everything in, the, in those holdings. Um, so I can show you a little bit of them, but uh, I've got to focus on what uh, we have digitized at this point. So we also, it's not just from that one um, collection that these photographs uh, have come from. Uh, they've also come in through different um, to people from British Columbia that were involved in Girl Guides or some, to, some of our photos are of unknown origin. So we have a large uh, visual records collection that is an amalgamation of a variety of different sources of photographs that we've combined into being this, this big uh, photograph collection. So this is one of those. This is a photograph from the Archives Visual Records Collection. Two girl guides outside their tent at the Lake O'Hara Adventure Camp. Uh, and so you can, people can learn a lot of different things about uh, guiding uh, from photos like this. You can learn about uniforms, you can learn about the sort of activities that would have uh, uh, gone on around this time. So I think this is going to be early in the uh, 20th century. I would say around uh, 1920, but someone who is an expert in uh, girl guide uniforms could uh, say more. Uh, one of the places that the uh, photographs of girl guides in our collection have come from is from a person named Phyllis Mundy, who was a girl guide in her early years. Uh, and this is an image of her uh, as a guide uh, in Vancouver. And she would later go on to become a, a quite a fa famous prominent mountaineer. There is, um, she, along with her husband, she scaled a lot of uh, peaks across British Columbia. Uh, and there is even, I believe, a Mundy Peak somewhere in British Columbia. Uh, so, so with when she and her husband and her family donated records, uh, it was it's a lot of her regular life. It's a lot of the other things she did in her life. Of a lot of images of of mountaineering, um, but also of being involved in the Girl Guides. So it's as people go about their lives, about the function of their lives, and they take, they document uh, things that are going on. Um, those are part of their own personal records collection. And um, so if, they're, if you're involved in a community event, a community activity, if you're a Girl Guide, if you're a Boy Scout, if you're, um, you're doing anything really, and, and you document that in your own personal archives, those, those can wind up with us. So yeah, knowing how to look for things um, uh, is good, but it's also good to have uh, really good descriptions of archives so that we can, when we go, we as archivists go in and um, document the records and we identify sort of there's certain themes and subjects um, in the collections, we can, we can make those available for researchers. It's hard to know when you look at just a box uh, what's in it. Uh, so that's our job is, is to make those clear. This is another image from the Monday family phone uh, and it shows another um, a girl guide troop possibly from the second uh, Vancouver company. We don't only have uh, photographs, we also have these textual records. 
so some of these uh, that we have digitized, we don't have a lot of our textual records available digitally, but um, some of these we've, we've scanned just because they're visually appealing. Uh, so this is the front of a Brownie Secrets uh, volume, Picture Stories and Games. I'm assuming, although I'm not, uh, I'm not the top of my game on, on Brownie history, is that this is, doesn't, uh, uh, isn't applicable today. That you've gone <laughs> from it, I don't know. That's <laughs> awesome. Um, you can see the, the evolution of different uh, activities and, and through these. I just have one more slide on those. Uh, the ever-present uh, Girl Guy cookies, we have, uh, uh, records of how those have developed, uh, how what the branding looks like, how um, how these would have been marketed to people, what the sort of the reactions to them would would be, and it's, it is really useful for for showing the development of uh, Girl Guides in British Columbia. So uh, now in our, our short amount of time, I don't want to go too far over. Uh, I want to show you uh, one specific kind of record that we haven't talked about yet. So one of the uh, records that we have in our collection, uh, one of the record formats that we have in our collection is documentary art. Uh, so uh, it, it's not just art. We do have a lot of uh, art of paintings and drawings and prints from famous artists such as Emily Carr that are sort of critically acclaimed and thought of as high art. We also have a lot of art works and sketches that are by British Columbia residents or um, amateur artists that document what uh, the province looked like in, cer in certain particular uh, times. So what I want us to do today is our, our quick activity is to think about uh, what, how you would document your life right now uh, and what's important and unique about that and do a, a quick sketch for us uh, here. So what documentary art is just uh, representing how you, you feel about the world, how you see it and about your own surroundings. So what I want us to do, I want us to grab a piece of paper and a writing utensil. I'm, I'm using a pencil because uh, that's the archivist way. Uh, and, and sketch as quick or as detailed as you would like about uh, what, what is important in your life right now and your surroundings. I know a lot of us are spending a lot of time at home right now. Um, and so maybe what's the most important to you right now is what's inside your home. Maybe it's something that's going on outside your home. Maybe it's uh, a, if you're feeling a, a lack of connection. Maybe that's something that you can sort of understand to um, or convey through, through art. So I'll show you what I've done. This is, I've done it so quickly just now. Um, this is what I've done. I've sketched out, I'm hoping you can see it. A little bit. <laughs> okay, I've, I've sketched out, this is uh, what my living room looks like right now. I've just, uh, I've just moved. And so all right, all Kate, I'm just jumping in. If you um, stop sharing your screen, oh, uh, then we'll be able to see. There we go. Much, much bigger. Okay. So if you can see that, it's a little bit bigger, a little bit more detailed. Um, so I've just moved and all my walls are blank, which explains this wall behind me. Um, and I've just uh, gotten access back to my uh, sewing machine. So I've started sewing uh, masks. So this is a, a, a drawing of the, my desk that's set up right in front of a window which has a lovely view. You can see mountains and trees in the background and my sewing machine uh, and the fabric right there. The fabric beside it has hearts on it. Um, so that's what, what I thought might be important about my life, about uh, sort of to document what's going on right now. And then to make this an official archives document, what you need to do is to give it a title, uh, give it a date, and uh, given an official accession number. So I'm gonna give mine a title. Um, I'm going to be, I'm just gonna call it something very simple. I'm gonna call it sewing mask. And I'm gonna say I was, it was done on May 27th, 2020. I'm gonna write that on the top of this here because I have the space. If you're doing this on the, if you're trying to accession, um, 
a photograph, you might want to write on the back of something with a pencil um, and give a, give some context, give some give some dates, give some who's in it. Um, and you can give a description of it as well, so that when you're looking back at this in the future, or if someone else is looking at it, uh, you, they can have more of an understanding of what is going on in, in your drawing, in, or if you're, if you're photographs, if you're doing it with photographs. And the last thing I am going to add is an accession number. So an accession number for us uh, at the archives ties that um, ties that record into its description so that we can keep uh, control over those records. So because this is the first piece of art I've done this year, I'm going to give it a very simple number. I'm going to call it 2020-0001. Uh, and that's, and giving those three zeros before the one means that I can make up to up to almost 10,000 records. I can do 10,000 uh, pieces of artwork if I, if I so chose. Uh, and so that's, that's how, that's what I've done today. Um, and uh, if you want to uh, continue along, you can also expand this to your other um, records that you create. You might be a, a diary writer uh, and you want to uh, keep those safe and keep control over them. You might want to add in some more descriptive of, of when you were writing in those diaries. Um, uh, and or where you were, those those sort of things, so that it adds some more context, and and you might be able to to understand them better in the future. Great. Well, thank you so much, Kate, for this. This was awesome, and thank you to Chris and to the Royal BC Museum for having us here. Um, it was so exciting to get to see some of those old pictures and archives for Girl Guides. Um, before we head off, we just have a few announcements about some exciting things that are coming up for the rest of the year. As of tomorrow, all see girls in September. Um, so we would love to have everyone join us then for you hop on and register if you haven't yet. We also have a national live advancement ceremony happening tomorrow at 4 p.m. If you want to visit, it will be on the Girl Guide National Facebook page. And then finally, we have a few more virtual BC events coming up. We have the Vancouver Art Gallery. We're going to be heading over there next Thursday, June 4th at 6 p.m. And one of the program coordinators there is going to be telling us all about Emily Carr. So make sure that you tune in to the BC Facebook page again for that. And we're also gonna have a few more exciting announcements in the next few weeks. So make sure that you keep checking back. And then finally, just make sure if you um, put your own archive together, we would love to see it. So make sure that you pop it in our comments for this live Facebook and we might share some of them. Um, so thank you once again, Kate and the museum. And I hope everyone has a lovely evening.